All right, well, I'm going to dive right in today because I actually have 17 pages of notes, so, but it is size 18 font, so that should relieve your fears. But my eyes are aging a little bit, so I need those bigger letters these days. All right, well, as you know, in the chapters you read for today, Israel finally arrives at Mount Sinai, the mountain that God promised Moses he would bring Israel to after he released them from Egypt. Well, it's been three months now since they left Egypt. And during those three months, we've seen Israel survive near dehydration at Mara, right? Where God miraculously turned the bitter water into sweet. We saw them very hungry, facing what they thought was starvation in the desert of sin. But God, again, miraculously provided for them. He fed them the bread of angels and meat from quail. And then they came to Rephidim, and the whole story is on repeat. They couldn't find water. They complained faithlessly to God. And again, God miraculously provided for them. We're not told how Israel responded when the Amalekites came and attacked them at Rephidim, but given their history, we can kind of imagine, right? But again, God miraculously provides for them. As long as Moses holds his arms in the air, they prevail against their attackers. Well, in today's chapters, Israel confronts another obstacle. This time, it's not hunger, it's not thirst, it's not even war. It's a great big mountain. It's a literal mountain, and it's a figurative mountain. And this mountain is what stands between them and between enjoying Abraham's blessing in the Promised Land. You know, this summer, my family and I visited the Grand Canyon for the first time. And as we kind of crested the edge of this deep crater, I couldn't help but think, you know, what do the pioneers and settlers trying to just get west think when they're, they come across this massive crater in the earth? I mean, it was a mile deep. It's 277 miles wide, 17 miles long. Like how They can't just take their covered wagons down <laughs> into this ravine. They have to go around it. Well, I think Israel probably felt the same way. Oh, how do we get around this? when they came to the mountain. So like those pioneers heading west, Israel too has hit an impressive obstacle. They can't climb this mountain. In fact, they can't even touch it. And neither can they begin to scale the mountain of laws that God is going to reveal in this place. So here they are at Mount Sinai. This mountain, as you know, just it dominates the landscape, but it also dominates the Pentateuch. They're gonna spend two books of the Bible here, they're going to spend almost a year of their lives here. They'll construct the tabernacle here. They're going to receive the 613 ordinances in addition to the Ten Commandments here. They're going to hear and see God's presence in their midst. They're going to fail here and experience God's crushing judgment. But Moses will intervene for them here, and they will also experience God's mercy. So dominant is this mountain to Israel's history that even, I even think this narrative has been constructed in the shape of a mountain, and I'll show you what I mean. So there are five major plot points in this narrative which take the shape of a mountain, and you can see there is a mountain-like drawing, thank you, Doc, <laughs> in the handout for today, so you can record those five plot points. But the first one, letter A on your handout, is Israel arrives at the mountain, and they set up camp here, and then they wait. Moses, of course, just promptly um, speak, climbs the mountain to speak with God. And when he comes back down, he relays God's message to them. This is from Exodus 19, 4 through 6. He says, in this message, he's doing a couple things. But the first thing he does, he reminds Israel who he is, and then he makes a conditional covenant with them. He says, look, I am the one who destroyed your captors, and I carried you out of Egypt. If you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then I will do two things. First, you will be my treasured possession. And that is really astounding, because all the earth is mine, God says. And yet, out of all these people on the face of the earth that I own, I choose you to be my treasured possession. He didn't say, I choose you 
you miserable lot of slaves, you hard-hearted, grumbling, faithless people. He didn't say that, but he could have. But the point of this story is it's that this kind of God, the one whose power was manifested in Egypt and destroyed the Egyptian army, is the kind of God who chooses this kind of people to be his treasure. But not only does he choose them to be his treasure, he commissions them to do his work. So the second half of verse 6 says, You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Well, this is Israel's mission, and this will be further unpacked throughout the rest of the Old Testament. But essentially, this is a, uh, a commission to be God's representatives to the watching nations. That's what a priest is. Israel is to be holy, completely set apart from the pagan nations. They are to look nothing like them. And they are to bring those nations, by their holy behavior, to the God of Israel. This was Israel's mission, should they choose to accept it. And do they accept that mission? Okay, plot point letter B, halfway up the mountain. This kind of feels like when you're reading the text, it almost feels like the mountain peak moment, right? Israel hears God's covenant, and they say, yes, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. They say that in verse 19, verse 8. We're all in. This is a good moment in Israel's history. But the story gets better. We're only halfway up the mountain at this point. Well, after Israel makes this vow, they consecrate themselves for three days in preparation to actually meet with God and hear the demands of the covenant. And then at the peak of the narrative, plot point C, this is the figurative mountain peak of the story, God himself descends on the mountain in fire. The mountain trembles, thunder reverberates, lightning crashes, a loud, a loud trumpet is just blaring, and then God himself speaks. They hear his voice. This is the mountain peak moment. Now, of course, a couple other things are going on here. Before God speaks, he mercifully reiterates his warning to Israel. So he delays giving the terms of the covenant because he wants Moses to go back down the mountain. So, you know, Moses is like up and down, up and down, up and down this mountain all throughout the story. So Moses, go back down and tell the people not to cross the boundaries or don't even touch it or I will break out against them. And Moses thinks, oh my goodness, I've already told them that. They know that the boundaries are in place, but God says go. So we already see God's mercy on full display in this narrative. But only then, only then after the, his warning has been reiterated, does God speak from heaven. And that is plot point C, God speaks. Okay, now that we've crested the mountain, we're at plot point letter D, and this is halfway down the mountain on the other side. God speaks, and the people are ex excited, right? Well, no, they're actually terrified. They don't want to hear from God directly, really, ever again. So they ask Moses to be their go-between. They're like, you tell us what God says, and we will do it. But don't let God speak to us again, or we'll die. So they do reiterate their promise or their intention to listen to Moses as he tells them what God commands. But they turn from God's voice in fear here. And then, plot point letter E, Israel again at the foot of the mountain, unchanged. They've not moved physically, and as we come to see, they've not moved spiritually either. So chapter 20 ends right where chapter 19 began, at the foot of a mountain. Again, the people cannot scale this mountain. They cannot reach God. They can't even bear to hear him speak. Well, that's the shape of the text. The mountain peak is, of course, God's revelation from heaven. Look at Exodus 20, 22. This is where God says, You have seen for yourselves how I have talked with you from heaven. And this is the main point of the entire story. God has spoken. He has revealed himself to us. And those words that God spoke from this mountain are enormously significant. And not just for Israel, but for all of us. But before we look at those words, we need to observe the actions of the other players in the scene and just make five quick observations about that, the story here. 
All right, so initially, Israel eagerly agrees to obey the covenant. Should we believe them? I do. I think, you know, as far as they're able in this moment, they really want to believe God and they obey God and fully intend to do so. So the story isn't here for us to just cynically roll our eyes at Israel again. Instead, Israel's actions in the narrative and all throughout the book are instructive for us. First, because they reinforce something we already know by now, based on their actions at the Red Sea, based on their complaints at Mara and the Desert of Sin and Rephidim, we know that Israel is incapable of meeting the demands of the covenant. Even though, as we can see, the demands of the covenant are, are not that difficult. <laughs> These are completely reasonable and good, and, and societies that live by these principles that are revealed from the mountain flourish. But even so, keeping them is beyond Israel's ability and beyond our own ability. So in Israel, we need to see our own inadequacies. You know, it's not just masterful storytelling that Israel in the wilderness is just a disheartening parody of Pharaoh and the plagues. Okay, in Numbers 14.22, God accuses Israel of testing him ten times in the wilderness, much like Pharaoh tested God ten times after each plague. So like Pharaoh, Israel has witnessed and will continue to witness the awesome power of God. But like Pharaoh, they will continue to harden their hearts and, and, and walk away in unbelief. So we cannot walk away from this study without recognizing that we are all Pharaoh. We are all Israel. We are foolishly and hopelessly hard-hearted without God's intervention. Okay, but secondly, Israel's faithlessness, faithlessness prior to Sinai and after Sinai highlights God's faithfulness. So Israel is a foil to God. That's the word we use in literature. They he, their actions are in direct contrast to God's. They set his character in sharp contrast with their own. But even though that's true, God, nevertheless, is still fully committed to keeping his promise to Abraham. God has chosen to bless all the nations of the earth through these people, and he is going to do that despite their faithlessness. God will be faithful. Okay, third, without looking at your notes... Can you think of a time, a previous time in scripture, when God spoke directly with his people, where he blessed them, he gave them a command, and he gave them a job to do? Okay, I'm hearing little mumblings there. <laughs> Sinai parallels Adam and Eve in the garden. This is supposed to be an Eden reboot, okay? God is again with his people. He's speaking with them directly. He's going to bring them to a new home where they're going to be fruitful and multiply and fill it. And they're going to expand that kingdom. And they're going to live under his rule and obey his commands. It's just like it should have been in the garden of Eden. But of course, you know, we have all the wisdom of hindsight. And we know Israel is going to fail just like Adam and Eve failed before them. Again, the laws and the ordinances that God imparts from this mountain, they are like a figurative mountain of their own, and Israel will never scale them. But again, the failures of Adam and Israel will not derail God's plan to bless the nations through Abraham. But I do want, I do want you to note, as we settle into the text today, the parallels between Eden and Sinai. Okay, fourth. What do you make of this language of fear in Exodus 20, 18 through 21, where Moses says, Fear not. God has spoken to you, so you will fear him. What, what, what are we supposed to think of that use of the, those uses of the word fear? Was Israel wrong to be afraid of God? Well, there is an appropriate fear of God. Hebrews 12, when it recalls Israel's experience at Sinai, uh, it says in verse 21, Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. So Moses was afraid too. Moses had the good kind of fear, though. The fear that stands in awe of God's power and of his holiness. It's a fear that recognizes its own unworthiness in the sight of such a God, and even its own condemnation. 
but it is a fear that propels you to go to this God and rather than turn away from him. So the wrong kind of fear also acknowledges these truths about God's power and holiness. It sees those things, it feels its condemnation, and it runs away in terror. So Israel's response here kind of reminds me of how the Gentile towns responded to Jesus in Mark 5. So in Mark 5, this is where Jesus uh, takes the boat over to the, you know, you know the different texts pronounce it differently. I think I have Gerasenes here. He takes the boat over to the Gerasenes, and he expels Legion from the man who inhabits the tombs. Well, Legion, of course, asked if he, they can go into a herd of pigs on a hillside. You know, that's like the surest sign you're not in Israelite communities, right, where there's a herd of pigs. So that he does. God grants them that permission. They inhabit the swine, and they send them plunging down the hillside to their deaths in the sea. Well, that creates quite a scene. People kind of come out to see what caused this devastation, and they find Jesus. And they see this man, who they know, sitting fully healed beside him, and they see the drowned pigs, and they are terrified. And so what do they do? They say, please leave. They beg him to leave because they are scared. The person they needed the most, right, was right there in their midst, but they were too afraid to even speak with him. They sent him away. Well, Israel's greatest need is for God to speak to them from heaven. We need God to reveal himself to us. And, and they do reaffirm, like I said, they do reaffirm their intent to listen to Moses, but they turn away from God's voice. So I think this is somewhat of a cautionary tale for us. Israel is afraid of God, and, and they fail to see his mercy at the mountain. And God's mercy shows up in a number of ways. It shows up in the boundaries he put in place, right? It shows up in his repeated warnings for them not to cross those boundaries. And it shows up in the Ten Commandments. But still, Israel turns away in fear, preferring the presumed safety of distance. So let their example remind us that it is much scarier to turn away from God's voice. Let, us, let this narrative remind us that we should keep turning back to God and to hear his words. Okay, fifth observation. What about Moses in this text? In spite of his fear, he just disappears into the cloud of smoke on the mountain. He goes right into it because he knows his greatest need. He needs to hear from God, and he knows Israel needs to hear from God. So Moses is already behaving as a priest here for Israel, and his actions hint at what is to come. It's the institution of the priesthood that's going to come in the next chapters. Israel needs an advocate before God. And that is precisely what God is going to give them, first in Aaron, and then ultimately in Jesus. But his actions also suggest the role, again, that Israel is to play for the nations. Israel is to communicate what God is like and to communicate his demands to the pagan nations around them. Okay, so those are the five things we can learn from the story. But now I want to turn our attention to the actual words that God spoke from heaven. And we'll just answer three brief questions. What did he speak? Why did he choose these words? And what do they mean for us today? So what did he speak? Well, he spoke the terms of the covenant, right? Israel had just agreed to obey his voice and his commands. So he gives them ten commandments which Israel would refer to as the Ten Words or the Decalogue. Well, why did he speak these words in particular? A, a few reasons here. God intended these Ten Commandments to reveal something. They were revelative. He was revealing his character, and he was contrasting his character with the character of mankind. So these commandments set the character of God in sharp contrast with the character of man. So did you notice how God, when he comes down to speak these commandments, he has to come down. He has to descend to a mountain peak. But he's at the top of a mountain that Israel can't even begin to climb, right? That, that, that just highlights the disparity between God and people. Well, the Ten Commandments do the exact same thing. My uh, previous pastor, his name is Mike Fulmore, had a 
devotional plan he gave his children when they first started trying to read the Bible. And it was very simple. They would just take a text of scripture, and then they would answer two questions. The first one was, what does this teach you about God? And the second one was, what does this teach you about you? Well, that's how we can read the Ten Commandments. In these ten simple commandments, we learn a lot about God's character, and we learn a lot about ours. So first, what do they reveal about God? Well, they reveal that God alone is God, and he will not share his throne or tolerate the worship of anything that is not God. We learn his very name is holy. So holy is his name, it cannot be used flippantly or used to make promises we can't keep. We realize that God is jealous of rival loves, just like any faithful spouse should be. In these commands, we see that God punishes wickedness. He cannot tolerate it. But we also find him to be loyal beyond our understanding, where he promises to show love and mercy to the children of his people for generations. Beyond those character qualities, we learn that God has a heart for justice. We learn that he loves the truth. We see his impartiality. We see that he cannot be tainted by sin and that he cares very much about how his people treat one another. We can infer from this that he wants us to share his holiness and to partake of his character. These laws actually hint at all the ways God will describe himself in just a few chapters when he passes before Moses and he declares his name. Okay, but on the converse, these commands reveal that mankind is nothing like God. We may have been created in his image, but my, how we have fallen. We are unholy, disloyal, prone to rebellion and superstition, idolatry, sexual perversion, <laughs> selfish ambition, greed, covetousness, and deceit. So God spoke these words to be revelatory, but he also spoke them to be instructive. They teach us, they teach God's people to be like God. Because if God's people are going to be a holy nation and to be his treasured possession, these laws must be obeyed. God's character has to be mirrored in the character of his people. And this is precisely what the New Testament teaches as well. We are called to be holy like God is holy. Jesus said our righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. The book of 1 John warns us that Christian people cannot willfully make a practice of unholy living. So these laws were intended to be revelatory, they were intended to be instructive, and then finally, these, this, these are just basic foundational laws to Israelite society. These are, this is not the final word, okay? These words are certainly not exhaustive. As I said before, over the course of the next year here at Sinai, they're going to reveal, God will re further reveal 613 ordinances. And most, many of them are just specific applications of what it means to not bear false witness against your neighbor or what it means not to covet. But many of them will just be more instructions about how they're supposed to be that holy nation and different from the pagan countries around them. Okay, what do these words mean for us? Okay, these commands are timeless. All of them, except the fourth, are repeated in the New Testament. So the Sabbath, the fourth commandment, was the sign that God gave Israel of this covenant that he made with them at Sinai. And we are not part of the covenant at Sinai, so we don't need to honor the sign of that covenant. So what role do these commandments play in our lives? Well, first, they condemn us. I mean, who among us is free of dishonesty or greed or the idolatry of vanity and pride? But our condition is even worse than we can imagine. Jesus showed us the heart behind these commands in his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. You see the parallels there? Jesus on a mountain speaking the words of God. 
Well, he says, you have heard a husband said, you shall not murder. But then he goes on to intensify the demands of the law. Don't think for a moment that you're holy or that you've kept the law simply because you haven't taken a life. If you have been hatefully angry with someone, you're guilty of breaking the sixth commandment. You have heard it has been said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you, if you've ever looked at a man who is not your husband with lust, you've broken the seventh commandment. In his epistle, James puts the final nail in our coffin when he says, if you've broken one of these commandments, you've broken them all. You're a lawbreaker. Lawbreaker, 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 lawbreaker. Every one of us. These Ten Commandments condemn us before God. No one can keep them. Not Israel, and certainly not us. But the commands also invite us to keep listening. God didn't stop speaking from heaven with the Ten Commandments. He had plenty more words for Israel. And he had a final and better word for us in Jesus. So these commands invite us to keep listening and to, and to listen specifically to God's final word to Jesus. So Jesus, of course, cast aside his divine rights when he descended from heaven. And he didn't just descend to a mountain peak, but he came all the way down to the darkest, dirtiest places of earth where he lived a holy life. He flawlessly kept the commandments, and he spoke the life-giving words of God to us. Repent, he says. I'm not here to condemn you, but to save you. Your sins are forgiven, he says. Follow me. And then when it was time, like Moses before him, Jesus climbed a hill. He disappeared into the smoke and fire of God's wrath on that hill when God broke out against him on the cross and judged the sins of the world. Jesus died there with every bitter thought and every evil deed crowning his blood-stained brow. Well, you know the rest of the story. Because of his holy life, Jesus rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven where he now sits in God's presence our perfect and permanent high priest. So we too have an advocate with God in heaven, one who is far superior to Moses, better than any of the priests that descended from Aaron, and one whose blood atones for all of our sins. In Jesus, we have been made holy like God. In Jesus, we have kept these commandments. So God has spoken to us from heaven. Okay, those barriers at the foot of the mountain are gone. We have no fear that God will break out against us because he has already done so in Jesus. There's no cherubim blocking the entrance to Eden. The veil in the temple is torn. All these guardrails are gone. So as the song we sang earlier today, we can arise Shake off our guilty fears and go directly into God's presence. So though these Ten Commandments condemn us, they also invite us not to run away or turn away in fear, but instead to clothe ourselves in Jesus' holiness and fearlessly stand before God. And that's really how we apply this text to our lives. This text is a warning for us today, much like it was for Israel. So the writer of Hebrews, a pastor speaking to his own congregation, is going to warn his congregation like we need to be warned from this text. He says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts like Israel did in the wilderness. And he'll say later in the book, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. So that's the first application of this text. Listen, don't harden your hearts, do not turn away. But if Jesus already has your heart, then this text is a reminder to hear his call to obey him. You are God's chosen race, a royal priesthood, 
a holy nation, a people for his own possession. You have been made these things. You have been made God's treasured possession for the purpose of proclaiming the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So if you are God's daughter, if you are his treasured possession, you too have work to do. And by your holy living and by your words, we too are commissioned to bring others to God, to our great God who has spoken from heaven. Let me close us in prayer. Dear God, thank you. Thank you so much for revealing yourself from heaven. Thank you for these words that, although they condemn us, they give us life in Jesus. Pray that you would give us strength to keep listening and to keep turning back to Jesus. Empower us through your spirit and through these words to live holy lives, lives that will attract those who are watching to you. Help us to speak the excellencies of you who has called us out of the kingdom of darkness into glorious light. We do so only in your power. In Jesus' name, amen.